what the problem was all along but that song uh, that David taught us kind of helped reaffirm that for me it wasn't at all in you or these kiddos it was certainly in the the leading of that song uh, but I appreciate you uh, leading that song and, and thinking about uh, you know sometimes it, it's easy to get into habits and to, to do things over and over uh, just out of habit but for us to think about new words and new songs and, and maybe it, it didn't sound as pretty as some of the others that we know so well but I'm sure it touched your heart and, and what a song we we need to learn and we need to think about and I think probably one that might be able to benefit us and help us even as we think about the topic uh, before us uh, tonight the the omnipresence of God. Is there some things that you struggle to understand? Uh, you, you, you struggle to grasp and you uh, struggle to really feel, uh, uh, get, a, get a hold of, of what's going on. I know there's probably a list, you know, a laundry list of things like that in your life uh, that you try to figure out. One of which to me, you know, uh, the same people that, that talk to me and tell me, I don't understand how you can watch an entire baseball game on TV or an entire round of golf, and, and yet those very same people can watch four days of a giraffe giving uh, labor in labor in the New York Zoo. And, uh, you know, there's some things you don't understand. And if you don't know about the uh, giraffe giving labor in a New York Zoo, then bless you. And uh, that's wonderful. Um, and maybe you can, we can talk about that after. But, you know, there's some things we just struggle uh, to grasp and understand and, and uh, maybe to make light because this subject before us is so deep and so great and I know it'll be uh, much to your uh, displeasure and, and maybe uh, there's not a single person here who thought I would go there but when you think about the omnipresence of God and as I mentioned last uh, time I spoke the omnipotence of God so much of what I'm bringing to you uh, is, is over my head and, and to go to scriptures and see that I'm thankful for men like Dwayne Bryant uh, he's a preacher and he's the instructor at the Southwest School of Bible Studies who's written a book called Who is Like the Lord and uh, so much of the things that I'm learning right Sam's been expounding the scriptures and talking about faith and, and so important to, to our faith and so many wonderful exhortations but who is this God in which we have our faith in how big is that God? How great is that God? And, and for so many of us, maybe he's, he's been too small. And so I hope at, at least we begin to expand our picture of this God. And, and here's another subject that I think will do that. And like I said, I'm trying to say is, is it won't be technical. Uh, it won't be uh, overly deep. And I would like to be very practical. And I hope it's something that can help us. But maybe we'll encourage you to, to go deeper and to search out men and women who have studied greatly and can talk more about the depths of the scripture and what it says about the omnipresence of God. But I think it's something that will benefit us and help us in this, this really difficult thing of, of forgetting about how important we think we are. Overcoming our self-importance, the solution to it. It reminded me of something I read recently about a young college graduate. He was asked to come speak at a congregation. Um, invited him to come preach, fresh off graduation. Of course, he knows more than so many people, but he comes to the congregation and he's poised to mount the pulpit and sure to impress God's people. His self-confidence was equaled only by his smugness, the writing says. It says, after his introduction, he started into his sermon, quoting his sources, citing multiple passages from memory in the congregation. However, they looked perplexed at his points. They couldn't understand exactly what he's trying to say and realizing that from their faces after five minutes uh, that even his main point was not being understood he began stammering and stuttering his frustration turned into fear then into panic he ended up stopping early and apologizing then he went down and he sat by the older preacher on the front row and that preacher leaned and spoke at his ear and he said if you'd gone up like you came down you could have come down like you went up and I, I think that's something we all need to realize. And we, we know and we think about the scriptures that teach us to humble ourselves. Let God exalt us. And yet, far too often, we want to be the ones that do that. And I hope tonight, 
as we began to think just briefly, scratch the surface on this really, really big topic of omnipresence, the ever-present God, that we'll be challenged. I know you'll be challenged. What we're going to do is look at two uh, characters in Scripture, and they're in the outline if you have the outline, um, and we're going to start in Genesis 32 to begin. But look at some lessons and just highlight these uh, two individuals, these two men, see maybe where we might relate and hopefully leave us with some practical examples as we think about the ever-present God in our lives. The scripture at the front of this bulletin, uh, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything's uncovered. It's laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Hebrews 4.13. I was blessed last week uh, when our elders opened my eyes uh, to that passage. You know, it comes on the heels of one that I quote all the time. I know that maybe the kids get sick and tired of, of hearing the same verse over and over and over again. It's always on my mind just to think of the beauty of it and to think of how great it is that we have this book in our hands. That's Hebrews 4 and verse 12, right? For the word of God, it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of my heart. It's powerful in the very next verse there. And somehow there's got to be a connection, right? Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's side. Everything's uncovered. It's laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must give account because he's everywhere present. Something that's hard to grasp. It's hard to understand. But that reality opened the hearts of so many men and women in Scripture, so many men and women in the audience tonight, so many of the faithful of West Hill, and we're blessed because you've learned a lesson, but maybe we've forgotten it. Maybe we never really grasped it and t taken a hold of it. I hope that these examples and the things that are spoken of from God's Word tonight will challenge you. Jacob and God's omnipresence. When you open your Bible and you read this strange account in, in Genesis 32, we won't wrestle with everything that's here, and, and perhaps it'll leave us with more questions. But there's one major glaring observation to me that's relevant to the topic. We'll begin as we look in verse 22. And maybe you remember here, Jacob uh, has wronged, right, the supplanter, the heel grabber, the trickster. Jacob, he's uh, tricked Esau so many years before in, in stealing his birthright. You may or may not recall and remember that, and yet now it's time to face the music, so to speak, and he's been preparing and, and trying to fix a way, and he's putting all, and he's grown rich over the years in his separation from Esau, and he, he's trying not to lose everything in his old family, but anyway, he's sent this per, uh, procession before him uh, to meet Esau, and this is before he's going to meet him personally. Uh, others in his group have met him, and he's found out that, that Esau not only has received those things, but he's coming to meet him. He's coming to you with 400 of his men. And so, scared, wondering about what is this, what's going to happen. The last time I met, and this is his brother, you remember, the last time I knew him, I, I had tricked him good. I'd gotten his birthright. I'd stole that in a very selfish manner, a very self-important manner. And here is when this account takes place. Verse 22, and he rose that night and he took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 sons, and they crossed over the ford of the Jabbok, the river. And he took them, he sent them over the brook, and he sent over what he had. And then Jacob, he was alone. You ever feel alone? I believe one of the powerful things that's going to come of this lesson, I hope, or at least as you study it further and you think about an omnipresent God, for so many, that's a fearful thing. It ought to be a fearful thing for everyone. But as we think about the comfort that can come from that, I, I hope that's one of the things. But here he is alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Verse 25, Genesis 32 reads, Now when he had saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip, hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he, he said, Let me go for the day breaks. But he, he said, I, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you've struggled with God and with men, and you've prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, for I've seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. 
I don't know if you are as baffled by this scenario as it comes to us in the account of Genesis as I am, but one of the things that, that can't escape me as I read through that, and even I can begin to start to understand and grasp, is that like so many of us, Jacob was unaware he was in the presence of God himself. The ever-present God and the, the omnipresent God as we think about who he is, and, and two weeks ago we spoke about his, his power. He can do anything, and he's empowered us. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so many things we we learn and think about that here connected, one of those all-inclusive characteristics of God, the omni-characteristics, his his omnipresent. He's everywhere present. And Jacob, of course, the subplanter, the heel grabber, he, of course, missed this special way, this maybe theophany, this special way God manifested himself in his presence. And I wonder if you've done that. I wonder if you're sitting there right now doing that. I wonder if you're burdened with life and you're hopeless because you felt the same way. More will be said about Jacob in a moment, but there's another individual as you look through Scripture and you think about um, What is going on? That's Jonah. That's Jonah. Would you turn in your Bibles to Jonah chapter 1? In in Jonah chapter 1, see the Bible is really clear, especially in the Old Testament, about the presence of God. Uh, Many men uh, understand that. Um, But the story of of Jonah is kind of interesting as we think about it, especially uh, pagan gods and and others when you you consider what they believed. Um, For instance, when we talked about the omnipotent God, we made mention of uh, the gods of Egypt and the way in which uh, God showed his power over those deities or at least the things that they could control uh, when he came with the plagues of Egypt when he showed his power and his might. But remember, they were, they were isolated. They were Egyptian gods. And so that's the way the world would think. They would think in terms of, hey, God is limited to geogra- uh, geographical area boundaries, right? Maybe mountains, right? Maybe valleys. There was a God for different things. And so, so God was, or your God was in a specific area, a particular area. And to grasp that and to understand this concept's important. It seemed Jonah believed the same thing, but he was quickly going to learn otherwise. Now just read a few uh, of the opening uh, verses. Jonah chapter 1. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah, Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish, maybe Spain perhaps, uh, the opposite end, the opposite way of which God wanted him to go to Nineveh. And so we see he he goes. And so he paid the fare. He went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. I'm trying to escape the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind to the sea, on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Verse 5, then the mariners were afraid, and even they cried out to this, to his God. And they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah, he'd gone down into the lowest parts of the ship. He laid down, and he was fast asleep. And so the captain came to him, and he, he said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps it's your God, uh, or perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us. For what cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? What do you come from? Where do you come from? What's your country? What people are you? And so he said to them, I, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. The sea, the great abyss, the place where God, of course, would not dwell. And we think about uh, what is going to happen and what's going to take place. Oh, if we could just read through and think about it. Have you ever been in Jonah's situation? And, and I don't think any of us would ever maybe admit as much. Or it maybe was never as obvious the case. And I'm fleeing the presence of the Lord. But, but how many of our actions betray us? 
when we speak to our spouses, we're leading our children, when we walk to work, when we walk through work, and when we think about the people we're called to be and what we're called to do and who we represent. I don't know if you notice, and you think about who Jonah was as you investigate the story and think about the self-importance. See, Jonah had a different mission. He had a different, see, he didn't necessarily want to get rid, he admits as much. Did you hear him? I fear the Lord God of heaven, the, the, the Lord of the sea. I fear the one true and living God. I'm a Hebrew, but, but I still feel like I can escape his presence. He thought that God should have done something different with his power. God, you're, you're all powerful. I know that you can forgive and you can do. How are you going to forgive the Assyrians? How are you going to forgive these people? Write so many more things and maybe many of you are ahead of me in there. We could say a lot about that, couldn't we? But he thought he knew better. And sometimes I think I know better. It's hard to walk through the doors that God is opening, to be led by the God of heaven and earth, to be who he wants me to be, most of all because I have a different idea. It would be easier to do it my way. I'm going to have to give up something uh, to go through that door or to be this person. And there's such great freedom and understanding and uh, comprehending the omnipresent God. And I hope we'll think through a few of these things as we consider these two men and, and who they were and what they were doing. We think about uh, the omnipresence of God. We think about how powerful he was. And we think about maybe even sort of a definition uh, when, when Jesus is at the... Uh, uh, with the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well in John chapter 4, something's profound is said about omnipresence, about the omnipresent of God, uh, presence of God, right? And they're talking about their worship. Well, where should we worship? Where will we worship? And, and Jesus has drawn this woman into a theological discussion, and they begin to think about God, and, and he reminds her or tells her maybe, right? God is spirit, God's not a spirit. He is spirit. He is ever present, right? Because he is in his fullness. And we think about uh, that's what makes God able to exist in all places without being physically confined to a single location. He could be everywhere at once. And uh, I don't know about you, that's the point that it starts getting right here. And I'm trying to grab it and starting to try to comprehend. And, and I hope you'll remember some of the things we said and the omnipotence of God, right? If we could grasp it, if there weren't secret things, would he really be God? And we have to have a great faith in so many of these topics and so many of these subjects as we think about his everywhere presence. It, we know as we read through the Old Testament, the burning bush, even with the wrestling match. We think about in other places where God appears, a theophany, a, uh, he manifests himself in other places, in, in, every, uh, in different places at different times. But that doesn't limit his ability to be everywhere else also. I don't fully get it, but that's something amazing about the God of heaven who created us. I, I was reading through in that book, Dwayne Bryant talks about the opportunity he had to go to New Zealand, and he was lecturing and, and doing some things, but they had uh, an interesting opportunity to, to go and to look into the stars. And the, uh, as they were looking, the telescopes they were looking at, they could see Saturn. And he, he just loves uh, astronomy and the things of astronomy. And he talks about being able to just look into the greatness uh, of the universe, but to, to be able to see Saturn. He said, wasn't all you remember, maybe it wasn't as detailed as you could see in the, uh, the books, the textbooks as you're growing up, and maybe images you could see online. But he could distinctly make out Saturn and the rings uh, around Saturn and it was the thought that came to his mind and I wish thoughts like this came to my mind more often that I was so caught up in God I was so caught up in the ever-present God that I would glorify him in the way in which Dwayne Bryant did and maybe it's not something so special but he he remember or he he writes about having this thought that 
that even way, way out there, God knows the weather in Saturn. <laughs> He's everywhere present. And it begins to think about it, or it, it just begins to, if you, you stop and meditate for any time at all, I hope it does what it did to Jacob. I, I saw God face to face, and he didn't kill me, or I didn't die. There's trepidation in his heart when we think about the creator of the world and we talk about his justice as we spoke a few weeks ago about his wrath and who he is and, and yet he still preserved me. He's still with me. We should be weary of thinking of God as some impersonal force even though we talk about him as a spirit. He, he's also very real. He's not a feeling or an idea or some nebulous force that permeates the universe. He, he's a God who's immaterial, but he's also one that's very personal. He's very personal. And the way he's manifested himself has helped us to see that. As we think about, you know, the inability for us to detect God with our five senses is sometimes troubling. Maybe it troubles you. As we think about a world, and can I pause right there? There is something, and I meant to start with this, and it's here now, and it fits uh, perfectly. So I'm going to say it. I had the opportunity uh, last week, and I know several others did, but uh, to see is Genesis history. Um, and maybe you've heard about the things that are going on. Is Genesis history, and, and some individuals took to the account of Genesis, and they began to compare it to, you know, the, the schooling in which they've grown up, in which so many have grown up, the paradigm that says this world is millions and billions of, of years old, and, and the story of it, to be a creationist and to think that the world could be created, and they start to look through the paradigm of Scripture, and they begin to confirm it through the sciences, Right? And it's incredible. And, and because the turnout was so great in the country, around the country for the movie, uh, this week, Thursday, and then next Tuesday, another encore showing of, of that in theaters across the country. I hope if you have an opportunity, you'll go see that, that your faith in what we have in our hands will be uh, uh, boosted as you think about we have in our hands the very word of God himself. But as we consider, you know, God and who he is and, and what he's done in our lives and, and think about uh, the power that's there, this invisible God whose fingerprints truly are everywhere, his invisible attributes being clearly seen from the creation of the world. He's ever present. And there's some things that come to mind, you know, as we think about uh, this invisible God running the risk of being out of sight, out of mind, like Jacob, out of sight, out of mind. For many of us, we, we fall into that trap. But on the other hand, we don't want to make God visible, reducing him to something uh, conceivable. I thought that was interesting. Uh, Exodus 20 and verse 4. And the banning of uh, idols and creating something in the image of God. Isn't that something we have this tendency to do? To, to, to boil it down into pieces in which we could understand. But as we study the greatness of God, you, you can't boil him down. He's bigger than that. He's greater than that. He's everywhere present. God can be exciting. He can be mystifying. He can be terrifying. But he could never be boring. You're here tonight to worship that God. And I know, I know that when we think about it that way, we certainly are not bored. You might be bored with the presentation of a preacher. You, you might be bored and maybe the topic and you, you've heard it before and you tune out. You might get bored as you think about the songs and what you sing, but we, can we refocus our thoughts and think about what we're doing? We're not just doing it because he's present. We're not just appeasing him because he's here, like a child who does what his, his mom tells him to do when she's in the room but because I love her so much, because I love him. He's worthy of that. He's worthy of every ounce of my being to, to fall down before him. He's with us in our midst. And when you leave, he'll be right there. He's ever present 
in his fullness in every moment he's spirit and i know that's hard maybe to fully wrap our arms around to wrap our hearts around but can i connect it to something and maybe in a practical way it will encourage us and it can help us turn in your bibles to to matthew chapter 28 matthew chapter 28 and you see uh the great uh commission and you think about what was said in that moment there's a powerful uh passage that speaks to the ever-present god in our lives and perhaps you remember when he, jesus is writing them as he's about to depart from their presence in a physical way a physical manifestation jesus in their presence says all authority has been given to me I, i've been given all authority in heaven and earth go therefore make disciples of all nations right baptizing them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit teaching them to observe all things that i've commanded you and lo i'll be with you always even to the end of the age can you think back to last sunday maybe a few days ago and maybe it was that you woke up And unlike other days, perhaps you, you paused and you said, I've got to remember that this is the day the Lord has made. This is indeed the day the Lord, I'm going to remember my purpose today. And I, I've put that before me and I, I've thought about who I'm supposed to be and where I'm supposed to go. God is with me always. And, and then though the, the ding on the phone came. The, the calendar began to fill up and I began to see all of those things that have to I have to get accomplished and all the people I have to please and and everything to to keep appearances and to do uh, right what's the, just the normal routine and and I didn't tell anybody about who Jesus was my life was so consumed and focused on other things that that I couldn't even be the person the light wasn't emanating uh, the glory of God it was emanating the glory of me I was reflecting all around my self-importance. Do you ever look back at your week and say, man, oh, that was more about me than it was my creator. See, if, if those verses are true, and you're here on a Sunday night, and I think most of you believe they are, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, as we think about our purpose and who we're supposed to be, we've got this commission, and God says, I'll be with you. I'm not just present in the world, right? I'm present with you in this incredible promise. I don't know how that hits you, but as we begin to think about that in, in relation to God being everywhere always, J uh, Jacob didn't, he just failed to see it in that moment. And, and you remember it was the focus was on him. How am I going to please Esau? How am I going to make sure my life's preserved? How am I going to at least keep all of the, the things in which I've accumulated to the best of my ability? And, and Jonah, how, God doesn't want to save those people. God needs to listen. You know, if he would do it my way, we could, you know, do this better. And, and we start to maybe put other people and things in, in front. We've forgotten that God's with us when things get difficult, when things get hard. When things get painful, I read something that helped me to see this and really sort of an illustration that challenged me and more than just challenged me, that encouraged me uh, because I've been there. If you, you, you've probably been there too. And when you, you ever, uh, actually I saw a few of you, I know some of you, you, what kind of person are you, right? When the, when the, the gas light is at uh, E and the the light is on you say like we've got 10 more miles we can make it or you immediately uh you know pull over what kind of per that that was a meme going on on facebook so i know some of you maybe have thought about that i don't know what person you are what type of person you are i think we could just keep on going right uh we can make it uh, a little bit further and a little bit further but there's something different about the way i drive when that happens than when the gas tank is full when the gas tank's full right the ac's blasting <laughs> speed limit is maybe a little bit more negotiable and you start thinking about uh, other things and you can just drive right through stoplights are no problem but what happens when that changes when it when it's on e there's definitely no ac no matter how hot it is it's windows down right and and it, stoplights mean frantic panicking and fail right and, and you start thinking maybe a little bit different and I was challenged to think in terms of the omnipresence of God. 
and our purpose. How do we walk through this life and fulfill the purpose God's placed with us? That he'll be with us as we exude the glory of God and we're lights to the world with this ever-present God as he walks with us. It's by living like the gas tank's on empty. It's what caused Jesus to empty himself and to leave heaven, to become flesh. He withstood the harsh temptations to seek out the marginalized. He mentored stubborn individuals, ignorant fishermen. He endured the shame of crucifixion. If you think about what Jesus did in Philippians chapter 2, as it talks about the emptying of self. Can I live that way a little bit more often? Isn't it interesting to see the transformation of Jacob, even represented in his name? I'm the prince with God, right? I, I'm no longer the, the heel grabber, but now I'm going to be a leader of people. I'm going to be the one in whom the nation of God's people is now named after, right? I'm Jonah. Not only do I profess, right, like Peter or Paul wrote to the Corinthians, we believe, therefore we speak. Isn't it interesting to think that now Jonah didn't just talk the talk, but he walked the walk. He realized he couldn't escape the presence of God. And I wonder if we will realize the same thing. God is with us always, even to the end of the age. I know many of us believe, but, but will we speak? Will we trust in the omnipresent God that he'll be with us always, even to the end of the age? This was a, um, something that was written in the opening chapter of a book on marriage how to help marriages, how to increase marriages, and it's maybe not what you would expect to find. It says someone's watching you right now as you read this. Think about that. The God who loans you life, he sees your every move, he hears your every word you speak, and he knows your every thought. And this is a good thing. You're seen by God. You're noticed. You're known. You're seen by God. You're noticed, and, and you're known. You see, because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I know maybe if you've thought soberly about that idea of a God who knows our every thoughts, but he's not there to stomp us out. And even as Sam spoke this morning, his long suffering with us is proof of that. He's walking patiently with us, ready for us to repent and to turn from that. One of the great blessings to think about the omnipresent God if you've ever felt lonely, if you've ever felt discouraged, if you've ever felt like you're on an island, and what's the point of this anyway? When we can come to meditate, trust in an ever-present God, it's a good thing that your very thoughts, every single word, it's naked. It's laid open before the creator of the world. Is that a good thing for you as you reflect upon your last week? How about today? Is it good that, that God is present in every situation and every moment? And, and if you're scared about that, if you're fearful about that, what a great opportunity we have tonight to pray with you, to encourage you. And maybe it's the first time of thinking about God in that way and his greatness and who he is and, and you just want to study more about that I would be thrilled to do that and I know there's many others who would love to do the same thing if you've never repented of self the self-importance confessing Jesus right confessing Jesus as the son of God being immersed in a watery grave of baptism dying to self being raised to walk in newness of life what an awesome opportunity to do that that you might be able to walk out these doors with Jesus himself, with God himself, as he'd smile down upon your life. Can we encourage you in some way? We'd love to do that as together we stand and as we sing. And you been to Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood?